Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is a very recent and ongoing case. This is definitely going to be a shorter video because we don't know a ton of the details yet, but I know that I've been following this case very closely and I know that a lot of you guys are following this case. I find that when I'm following a case that's very active and in the news, having to sift through different articles and sources can be a very daunting task. Each article will just give you a small bit of information about a different aspect of the case. So you find yourself trying to get a hold of whatever you can, hoping that each new source will give you more information that can give you the full story. I know that it can be a lot to keep track of, so that's why I wanted to hop on here and cover this case so that anyone who is following it can know everything there is to know so far in one place. With that being said, let's just get into the case. Rachel Morin is a 37-year-old mother of five children who went missing on August 5th, 2023 at around 6 p.m. in Bel Air, Maryland, which is where she was living at the time. Her five children range from ages 8 to 18 and share three different fathers. Those who knew and loved Rachel described her as a fighter. She worked very hard for her children as a single mom and she did everything that she could to provide for them. She was well-disciplined and raised her children to be respectful and well-behaved. She ran her own house cleaning business, which gave her a lot of flexibility to choose her work hours and choose how much time she was able to spend at home with her children. She was known to be very easygoing and pretty much always in a good mood. She was known to love reading, dance, listening to music, and exercise in her free time. Clearly, by the pictures we see of her, she is very fit and she's an active woman who cares a lot about her appearance. But at the time, her family said that all she was looking for in terms of a partner was someone who could love her in her raw form no matter what. So on the day she went missing, she started off her day in the early afternoon by heading to the salon to touch up her spray tan. Then she and her boyfriend went to the gym together at Planet Fitness. Her boyfriend then dropped her off back home by 5 p.m. After that, reports say that she was seen heading out on the Ma and Pa Trail for a hike going by herself. Again, she was into fitness, so this seems to be something she did on a regular basis. However, when she didn't return back home when she normally would have, her boyfriend, 27-year-old Richard Tobin, became worried, so it seems that he must have gone out and looked for her for a bit. Now, I don't know the exact details of how he found out that she was missing because I don't think they lived together. They might have had plans for later that evening. That part's not totally clear. But either way, it seems that he went around and looked for her for a bit because when he called the police at 11.30 p.m. that evening to report Rachel as a missing person, he told the dispatcher that he had found her car at the trail parking lot located off of William Street in Bel Air. So, this confirmed to them that she had made it to the trail. In the hours that followed, police, alongside friends and family, all set out to search for Rachel. However, after less than 24 hours of searching for her, by around 1 p.m. on the afternoon of Sunday, August 6th, Rachel's body had been found. A 48-year-old man named Michael Gabrzeski and his daughter, Cecilia, who was a friend or acquaintance of Rachel's, as well as their other friend, Evan, had joined in the search party early that Sunday morning. Michael is described as a Native American tracker who is someone who can detect, read, and properly interpret human and animal signs and tracks to find a specific target. I also saw in one source that he was, at one point, a National Park search and rescue officer. Now, I fell down a bit of a rabbit hole searching about the whole tracking thing, and it seems like they just use skills passed down from their ancestors to track for different purposes. It's kind of interesting. Let me know if you know more about it and if I explained it well or if I'm totally off. I will explain to you why I'm elaborating on him being a Native American tracker in just a minute. I also want to note that what I'm about to tell you has been disputed, so it's not 100% fact, it's just what's been reported from the witness accounts of Michael himself. So again, I am going to report it because this was all over the news, but take it with a grain of salt. It hasn't been confirmed, it's actually been disputed by the police, so just a warning before I tell you this information. So Michael, Cecilia, and Evan all decided to go check two drainage tunnels off of the trail, after Michael noticed what he described as disturbances on the ground close to the trail where Rachel would have been walking. 
Michael would later say that he sort of had this picture in his head to search the tunnels and he doesn't exactly know why. Then he said when he saw the tunnels, he got chills. He told Cecilia and Evan, when you search this area, she's not going to be out in the open. She's going to be tucked away somewhere. So Michael went into one of the drainage tunnels and Cecilia went into the other. And after entering that tunnel, Cecilia started hyperventilating really bad, according to Michael. So police who were nearby told her to sit down. And apparently when she did, she realized that she was sitting in a big pool of blood. And that is when she realized that she had just found the body of 37-year-old Rachel Morin. According to Michael, she had been found lying on her back fully naked and it was obvious that she had suffered very severe head trauma. Michael said that it looked like her face had been smashed in with a rock, adding that the right side of her face was gone. He said that there was a 15 to 20 foot trail of blood. So what he gathered from that is that she must have been beaten and then dragged to that area. He said that it looked like the killer was pretty much trying to erase her identity. He said that she could have been hit with a bat or something else, but he said that Cecilia noticed that there was a rock that was pretty much caked in blood. So his assumption is that it was the rock that was used to kill her. He would say that the trauma that she suffered was so severe that it definitely would not be an open casket at the funeral. It's a dramatic firsthand account from the man who says he uncovered the body of 37-year-old Rachel Morin. As investigators have already announced, the mother of five was found on the Ma and Pa Trail early Sunday afternoon after her boyfriend reported her missing Saturday night. But tonight, chilly new details into the deadly discovery. Today, he took us to the Ma and Pa Trail to show us exactly where he says he uncovered Morin's body. It wasn't far from the William Street entrance here. I'd estimate only about a quarter mile in. And before we share what he says he saw, we do want to warn viewers the details are graphic and what you're about to hear might be disturbing. I had never walked it myself. For Michael Gabrzeski. I told my stepdaughter, I said, look, it's not going to be laying out in the open. The Ma and Pa Trail in Bel Air, uncharted territory. I said she's going to be tucked away somewhere. But the former National Park Search and Rescue Officer has extensive experience tracking down missing people. So basically it's my passion to bring closure to that family by bringing her back and not having them wonder what happened. I just kept seeing tunnels in my mind. I don't know why, but I just kept seeing tunnels. Despite law enforcement swarming the area for almost a full day, Gabrzeski's stepdaughter locating the body in about an hour, the deadly discovery. Once we got down there and I started seeing them tunnels, I started getting goosebumps. Made in a tunnel drain, not far from the trail's main entrance. I saw a terrible mess. Gabrzeski's visions meeting the reality of a gruesome scene. There's not going to be an open casket, I can guarantee you that. He says Morin's body found in a pool of blood, suffering severe head trauma, an injury he believes could be the result of a rock. My daughter said that there was a big rock down there that was all caked in blood. It's about her. It's about bringing her home and somebody's mother, somebody's daughter. She left behind five children. Whoever the killer is, Gabrzeski convinced it's someone with close ties to the victim. Because it's, it, it's too personable. If somebody were just to do a, a thrill kill, it wouldn't be as brutal as what we witnessed. Now, police have not yet revealed exactly how she was killed, though I think that hearing this story, if Michael's accounts are true, it paints a very gruesome story. Her family reiterated that obviously she didn't go where she ended up willingly and that this death was not accidental. It's a clear homicide. That is one thing police have agreed with. They said that this was not an accident. This wasn't something that she meant to happen. She didn't end up there because she wanted to. It was a violent homicide. So after this, police are looking into possible suspects. Now, the reason I wanted to describe to you that Michael is a Native American tracker and what it means to be a tracker and his history of searching national parks is that a lot of people are a bit suspicious of Michael. Obviously, with him being the one to find her body and the fact that, you know, he left the trail and seemed to know exactly where to go, 
the way he described it in his interviews, it was a bit strange how he talked about it. He talked about it very nonchalantly, in my opinion. He did say that he just had this like image of the tunnels and, you know, what they would look like and that she was there and he got chills. I don't know if that's true. I'm sure he's just adding that to add a little bit of spice to the story. Not how I would go about it. But if he does have this extensive history of searching for people in national parks, then I can definitely see how he could like see a little bit of a disturbance and kind of know how to follow it just intuitively. And he also might have an idea of where someone might be hidden just based on his experience. So again, I don't necessarily agree with the way he described it. I don't like all the graphic details he gave necessarily if it's true that he really did not see the body. And I don't like that he talked about it so nonchalantly and added so many things to sort of build up his story. But at the same time, it could be just that he had this experience. That's why he was out in the search party to begin with. And based on his experience, he sort of knew where to find her. A lot of the different Facebook pages and groups talking about this case, a lot of them seem to think that Michael is pretty suspicious, but I'm still pretty 50-50 on that. Again, I do want to note that the police told some reporters not to listen to Michael's accounts of how he found the body, saying that he wasn't even the one to find it. But as we heard from before, he did admit that he didn't find her. He said that his stepdaughter did. But then on the other side, police said that he didn't even see her body, that he didn't see the blood, he didn't see anything. It was only Cecilia who saw it. So he could be telling a secondhand account of what he, you know, and his stepdaughter saw, or he could have seen it. We don't truly know, but police seem to think that he didn't actually see her body. So there's no reason he should be talking about those details. I do think that it's possible and probable that he is exaggerating what he saw and adding things again to fluff up the story. But I also do think it's possible that police are saying that he didn't see anything because they didn't want him to reveal that information, that maybe they want to keep more information close to the chest in case they do interview someone with guilt knowledge for how she was killed. I'm not exactly sure. Again, take this with a grain of salt. After finding her body, obviously her family was absolutely devastated and they still are. Again, this is such a recent situation and they're still actively grieving and trying to find answers. At this point, police have stated that they do not have a suspect in this case as of right now. But of course, a lot of people are looking at Richard as being very suspicious. Obviously, with any murder investigation, you are going to have people immediately look at the significant other as being suspicious. In this case, some people think the fact that Richard has a criminal record, they think that's concerning. Richard Tobin has apparently been arrested 14 times since 2014 on a wide variety of charges. This includes several traffic offenses, fugitive from justice offenses, resisting arrest, and disorderly conduct. He also has two past arrests for criminal second-degree assault, violating a restraining order, drug possession, and malicious destruction of property. It's also been said that these some of these charges are related to past domestic violence, but I'm not sure if that's rumor or if it's confirmed. So again, we don't know that for 100% fact. Since the discovery of Rachel's body, Richard's Facebook received a wave of comments with over 480 comments building up over the course of this case. The couple publicly announced their relationship on Facebook on August 1st, only four days before her death. I have read through the comments, any a sense limited who can comment, but many people are very suspicious of him and his involvement, while others are calling for people to stop this witch hunt. Some people are even going on there and making jokes about the situation. I think it's sick that people are already joking about the situation and that people are jumping to accusations. At this point, we don't have evidence that says he was involved whatsoever. At this point, it is literal rumors and speculation. The only thing connecting him to her murder is the fact that he was the last one who saw her. That is really it. But that's obviously not enough to say that he is the one who murdered her. For all we know, he could be grieving along the rest of the family, and these comments are just making things so much worse. At the same time, again, he could be responsible, he could know more than he's saying, but we don't know enough to even assume that or even say that at this point, so 
I think that this witch hunt, this assumption, this jumping to think people are guilty, I think that's absolutely wrong. This video could age poorly with everything that I just said if he is involved, but at the same time, I do think that if we don't have any evidence to support what we are accusing, it's not right to accuse anybody of anything without any information other than the fact that they were close to the victim. We see it all the time when people are accused of things and they're being hurt by all these accusations, they're being flooded with comments, and they turn out not to be involved, and people on the internet just made things so much worse for the investigation and the family, so that's all I want to say about that. Either way, after being flooded with all of these comments, Richard did respond to the post. He wrote, quote, I love Rachel. I would never do anything to her. Let the family and I grieve. Yes, I have a past, but I also have been 15 months clean and have changed as a person. Please. Reports from an anonymous source close to Richard say that Richard has cooperated with police. He gave them an interview and willingly gave them his cell phone to examine as well as his DNA. As of right now, police said that they do not have any suspects, but they are doing everything that they can to continue this investigation. They said as of right now, they have interviewed over 27 people already. They've received hundreds of tips and they also said that they don't know whether this was a targeted attack at Rachel or if it was just random. They have cautioned people in the area to just be aware of their surroundings. That being said, it's totally possible that this is a case of just a random attack. We've covered so many cases of women just being out there and exercising when they were brutally attacked and murdered by someone they didn't even know. We just covered the case of Lauren Heike in Arizona who was attacked totally randomly as she was hiking. We know the case of Karina Vitrano who was just jogging and she was attacked and murdered by someone in New York. And then Suzanne Eaton who was in another country and she was just jogging, minding her own business when she was also raped and attacked and murdered. So these cases are very real, they're very possible, so I do just want to urge everybody, especially women who like to be outside, who like to go hiking like I do, who like to jog outside, to just be aware of your surroundings, have some sort of personal protection with you like pepper spray, something like that. Just be careful when you're out and about. Anything can happen. Just be aware. Don't be overly paranoid, but just be aware of your surroundings and what's happening around you. I also do want to mention that just recently, Rachel's mother said that she noticed that she was acting a bit distracted in the week before her disappearance, so she was acting just a little bit out of character. Another source recently came forward and said that in the weeks before her death, she told one person that she was on multiple dating sites just before making her relationship with Richard public. So who knows, if that is true, maybe she was dating around before they made it official, or maybe she was still dating around after they agreed to be exclusive and Richard got upset about that. That part is unclear. We don't totally know. Again, just another thing to add to this case. I want to give you as much information as I can. So that literally popped up as I was about to record. So I did want to make sure I mentioned that. Police also stated that they were made aware of potential witnesses who may have seen Rachel on the day that she went missing. As of a few days ago, they have been able to identify and question those dog walkers who were on the trail at the same time that she was. There were five people walking their dogs between 6 and 7.30 p.m. last Saturday, and they may have been some of the last people to see her alive. So I am curious to see if anything will come of those interviews and if they really did see something. So that is all of the information that's been released up to this point. Rachel's sister, Rebecca, has started a GoFundMe to help with expenses for the funeral, as well as costs to help care for Rachel's five children since she didn't have any sort of life insurance. Rebecca, who is the mother to seven children herself, revealed that just days before Rachel's death, she had lost her own infant to sudden infant death syndrome. The whole family, including Rachel, have been grieving this loss. And now with Rachel, they have yet another devastating heartbreak in the family. As of right now, the last I checked, the GoFundMe has reached over $43,000. I do ask that if you do have anything to spare, please just donate whatever you can. I'm sure with everything they are going through, having to pay all these expenses is just something they shouldn't have to worry about. It would be really nice to help take some of the burden off of them. 
that GoFundMe will be linked down below. But that is all I have for you today. As with any recent case, I will keep all of you updated as more information comes out. If you do happen to have any information on this case, the authorities have set up an email for tips at rmtips at hardfordsheriff.org. But that is all I have for today's video and now I want to know what you think. What do you think happened in this case? Do you think that they're close to solving it? Do you think that they'll solve it soon? Or do you think this will be one of those cases that might take a long time to figure out who is involved? Let me know this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. Also, if there's any updates by the time I post this, comment those down below as well. I will try to keep you guys as updated as possible, so if there is any new information that comes out between now and when this video goes live, then I will try to keep it updated in the description box. But again, if you have any information, let us know down below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, and my Facebook page. All will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also linked down below. With that, hope you guys have an amazing week, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time.